Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. Later on in the program, we're going to talk a little bit about oil and gas development in Colorado. But first, you know him, you love him. He runs the editorial section of the Colorado Springs Gazette with a steel fist. No right. issue. No <laughs> issue is too small. No opinion. Wayne Logason, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me again. Hey, uh, I wanted to talk about a few other things, but... We're still dealing in the wake of what happened with the shooting in, in, uh, in, in Florida. Here in Colorado, we are particularly sensitive to this. Um, right. We remember Columbine. We remember what happened in Conifer. We remember what happened. I mean, it just, it, it, it happened here. We're learning more. What, let me ask you this one thing first. After Columbine, there were copycats. And there seemed to be this media agreement that from now on, we're not going to name names of shooters right. because we give them fame even if they die in, in, uh, in the uh, shooting and they're immortal and it, it gets other crazy people to do it. What happened to that, that very reasonable policy that, that media had? Well, they either just forgot or just decided it wasn't important anymore. Um, they name them all the time. The, you know, they put Klebold and Harris on the front cover, cover of, of what time, was it, Time, time Magazine. Yeah. And um, in, you know, immortalize them for anyone else who wanted, who felt life is worthless and meaningless, and I'm ready to end it, but I can go down as uh, something important. Somebody, uh, at least a footnote in history, from my nothing existence to a footnote in history. So it is very dangerous to do this. I really try not to name them. I don't name them. I, it's the shooter, the shooter, the shooter. It's very simple. You do not need to memorialize these people in the pages of newspapers and on radio and TV. They learned that. I swear, after, after Columbine, the media agreed to that and forgot. Is it just because we have all new people? I think that's part of it. I think just younger generations come up through the media and things get lost in the right. chain. And I see standards change all the time. You even see it in just the simple stylistic things with AP style and so forth. So it's not surprising. Here, here's, here's my hope. I, <clears throat> I saw a, a Democratic, uh, I think it was a congressman or senator, said those Republicans who have stopped gun control are accomplices in this. Yeah. One, that's, that's an ugly thing to say. But if that logic holds, then those Democrats who keep preventing good people from carrying guns in schools, you know, here in Colorado, you can carry your gun at CU, but not a teacher who's trained, not a principal, not a janitor who's been trained and gone through higher right. levels can be there to protect our kids. This is open season on gun-free zones. Let me say then, Democrats are the ones who are accomplices by not letting guns protect our kids in schools. Well, it is a real problem when you have people, and it's not just Democrats, but there is a heavy percentage of the people who are on that side of the political aisle uh, who think that a gun sign means right. gun-free zone. Um, right. The idea the, is preposterous that somebody who's hell-bent on killing a whole bunch of people, as many as he can, and giving his life for the cause in most cases, is going to obey a sign. Whereas a teacher and a principal will obey the sign, and a visitor, you know, a parent visiting the school will obey the sign. So the, that whole idea is, is kind of ludicrous from the get-go. Um, <clears throat> I, th I, so, I think about minority leader uh, Pat Neville in the State House. He was a high school student during the Columbine shooting. Right. For him, every year, he brings forward a bill because for him, this is, this is personal. It's emotional. He was there. Yeah. This could have stopped it. And every year, it gets, it gets shot down. Well, I remember right after Columbine, I started looking into this stuff. And uh, there had been a, a, a lower profile shooting a few years before in Pearl, Mississippi. And the shooter's name was, I'm not going to name him. Okay, right. I'm just, I almost, I, I'm trying to give detail here. But anyway, the shooter got out of bed, took his uh, dad's deer rifle, went into school, started shooting the school up. And the vice principal, Joel Myrick, a he, an American hero, a Harvard-educated man and a military veteran, sitting in his office, he hears the gunfire. He goes over there, sees the kids shooting people up in the quad, and his inclination was to reach for his Colt 45 officer's model and stop the shooting. Unfortunately, he had left it in a car hundreds of yards away because he obeyed the gun law. There was a gun-free zone federally at the time around the schools. He had to run to his truck, get the gun. By the time he got it, the shooter was escaping and, and had run to his car, gotten in it, and was ready to leave. He had plans to go shoot up the elementary school nearby. 
and Joel Myrick, the vice principal, pointed the gun at him, caused him to crash his car, then was able to hold him to the ground until the police got there and arrested him alive. Um, had the gun been in his desk where he wanted it, this is a Harvard-educated military veteran who can't have a gun in his desk. Locked in, you know, you, can, you, you have these boxes where they're touch sensitive, you can open them only with your fingerprint. There's all sorts of ways to safely keep a gun in a principal's office. He could have stopped that before seven kids were killed and a whole bunch of others injured. I know we need to talk about some other things, but let me throw a shout out for uh, Coloradans for Civil Liberties who've been having a program called FASTER that have been going out and training teachers how to, one, uh, stop the shooting and to administer first aid. Right. Now these have been mostly rural areas, but school boards in rural areas have been much more friendly to letting their teachers and principals uh, carry a gun. Well, that's, and, and, and this training is more extensive than what cops go through. So hats yeah. off to them, and I hope more, more, more schools take them up on it. That's the reason they're more friendly to it than an urban school is because when they dial 911 it's 45 minutes before anyone gets there. Yeah, but when and when 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 seconds count even in downtown Denver the cops are minutes away. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. But you, you really get a sense of that when when you're in, you know, the Hanover school district or some place like that. You live out near Pumpkin Center or someplace. So, our, what what we're saying in the Gazette right now is the federal government needs to and and Trump could really distinguish himself his presidency by leading an effort to set a federal standard for school security so that if you're going to have a gun-free zone, it's actually a gun-free zone. Uh, the only people in the gun-free zone who would have a gun would be uh, trained security guards, principals, other people who are approved to have a gun, but don't have a gun-free zone that disarms about, the Harvard-educated military veteran. Are you talking about veteran. creating a TSA for, for every school in America? Effectively, that's what we're talking about, because you can't get into your municipal buildings, your courthouses, an airport, most sports and entertainment venues. You can't walk around town walking into office buildings without them wanting to look in your briefcase, your purse, your coat. I don't like it. None of us likes it. But I like it a whole lot more than I like 17 dead kids every time we turn around. I think that's a false dichotomy. I, th I think that you know, there's one county courthouse. There's one big airport. You know, when there are scores of schools um, there uh, and having, having a security team at every entrance uh, do, doing that, it's, it's going to be tough. It I, is going to be tough, look, but it's better than dead kids. I have I, uh, I agree, two high schools in my community, just two. They both need, now my kids go to a private school, they go to a private Catholic school, and for me to get in there, I have to talk to someone who's behind bulletproof glass. I then have to enter my driver's license into a computer, which will print me a badge after I sign in, and it will print me that badge if I'm not flagged as a security risk for some reason. If I haven't been recently arrested it's or something. It's a Catholic church, and, and they have so a list of your how, sins. This is how the private sector does it. That's right. That's <laughs> if you how don't, the private if you sector don't, does if it. If you don't do penance before you go into the classroom, you're, you're going to get stopped. They That's know, right. Yes. I don't know how they know yeah, this, they, but I went to a Catholic school. The nuns know. Well, the priests tell. Yeah. They say they have this uh, you know, yeah. secret thing. Yeah, no. But seriously, that's how, the, that's how the private sector is doing it. Why, doesn't, why don't government schools look to the private sector? Because we're not having these kind of shoot 'em ups in private schools. But, I can think of only one. But go back to it. There hasn't been a shooting, thank God, on a college campus in Colorado uh, where, right. where guns are allowed. CSU has had guns on campus for over a dozen years now. Right. There hasn't been a shooting there. You know, so you, you, we could, Whereas we could, we could lock them Tech down. Was, Virginia Tech was a gun-free right. zone in one of the most gun-friendly states in the Union at the time. And because it was a gun-free zone, you had this shooter who had free reign for almost three hours. I know it, it, it hurts a lot of uh, snowflake kind of feelings, but you know what's cheaper than putting the TSA in every grade school and kindergarten room is to train adults in those schools to carry guns the right way, right. or to at least have them on premises in the way that you have mentioned locked up. I think that's a good part of the solution. Yeah, and that's, that's a little less expensive. All right, yeah. I, I wanted to talk to you about um, health care, and we, we don't have much time at all now. Thank you. That's the nuns. Um, you've, been on, you've been on a bit of a rant about changing health care costs. You look yeah. at the other side of the equation. How do you mean that? Okay, I want to change the entire way that society looks at health care. Every proposal, whether it's come from the right or the left, Democrats, Republicans, 
states or the federal government, it's always about who's going to pay. It's always about finding some third payer and divvying this up. Who's going who's gonna to get what? Who's going to pay for it? And, and all of this, of course, comes with a ton of rationing. We keep hearing about rationing. If we have socialized medicine, then we'll ration. Well, we already ration, OK? You and I got rationed when Obamacare kicked in, and they redistributed the health care we have. The rationing comes in the form of high deductibles, high copays, all that kind of stuff. What we're talking about in the Gazette is a supply side tsunami of health care. Instead of government resources going into third party payers, Medicare, Medicaid, you know, Obamacare subsidies, whatnot. And I'm not saying get rid of those things at all. I'm not saying get rid of Medicare and Medicaid. Take a chunk of that money that we used for expansion of Medicaid, for example, and start uh, facilitating a supply side tsunami of health care. We should have health clinics in every strip mall. Uh, health care should be sold the way groceries and fuel is sold. But the and reason the reason it's not sold that way is because we have this third payer problem right. that you're not buying it. If if you're buying health care, you'll shop around. Right. You 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 do that for your eyes. But you, if you, you might even do that for your dentist or your braces. But when it when it comes to the cold, you you, you don't do that. So a, what? So how would we increase the supply side of? Well, let providers? me give you an example. First of all, you can you can block grant things through the SBA to help entrepreneurial health care business businesses and stuff like. Right. You can do stuff like that. There's all kinds of things we can do like that. You can make it easier to become a healthcare professional by going to college, by incentivizing colleges, and by helping students through. But here's a, look, take a look at what Colorado is doing right now. Just this week, the legislature passed a House bill that will, make, that will allow all of the community colleges in Colorado, such as Pikes Peak Community College in Colorado Springs, to uh, grant four-year degrees for nursing students. So you can become a four-year uh, degreed RN by going, and it's a lot cheaper. It's a, a lot, we will, because we have a nursing shortage in Colorado is why this is breezing through the legislature. We also have a physician shortage. So we need to do everything we can to create so a surplus explain, of- a, Explain what this bill does, because I'm, I'm not following you. You can't just have a bill that says, get more nurses. So no. What, what, is, what does it do to get more nurses? Well, right now, Colorado state law forbids a community college, which is a primarily a two-year college, from offering a four-year degree in nursing. So now you can get, ah. last year they made it possible for community colleges to offer four-year degrees in emergency management. Now we're going into nursing. So that's exactly the kind of thing we need to do. It's a deregulation move to allow, to, to ease a log jam of healthcare professionals. To, to allow, so think allow, in those terms to, and to do more To allow community colleges, which which cost a lot less for a student a to go, less. go to less to, than half. To, to have a, a full nursing degree. Exactly. And so we're going we're gonna to create a surplus of nurses. We need to create a surplus of doctors, DOs, uh, PAs, whatever, NPs. Yeah, uh, but, but the Colorado Springs Gazette position that for the bill that would allow veterinarians to operate on human beings instead, I thought that was a bad idea. I love that one. I thought, I thought, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's fine for the vasectomy, maybe, but uh, I, I, I didn't like wearing that stupid collar. That was the problem. <laughs> TMI. <laughs> <laughs> Subject change. What do, all right. So after after that, what is the thing that Colorado can do? We're looking at block grants, opening up, uh, uh, deregulating well, education. Is there okay. Something Colorado else? did something a number of years ago that went very, very well for us, and and shockingly. Governor Hickenlooper thought about changing it last year. We got rid of what was called CONS, Certificates of Need. This is where if you wanted to open a healthcare clinic or a hospital or you wanted to buy an MRI machine for your clinic, you had to get the legislature to approve it. This is so bizarre. You, because th this is their Soviet idea, Union stuff. This, their idea is it will actually keep healthcare costs down because if you have too much competition for your business, you'll have to raise prices. Now, have you ever heard such a thing in any school of economics in your life that by keeping out competition, we're going to lower prices? Of course, exactly the opposite occurs, even in the sort of um, twisted market uh, twisted that we, market have, we have, a third payer. I yeah. want to empower patients to go where they need to go. Right. That's, you know, you want, you want that deregulated? Supply side and will then, do that. And then let patients have money to choose it. But 
understand that health insurance is an, it's an insurance. It is prepaid health. It's right. not like your car insurance. You don't ever want to touch that or your life insurance. Right. You never want to file a claim on that. Health insurance, you just think it's this endless thing. So, And you want to use it and you want everything to be really expensive because it's part of your compensation. <laughs> it's part of your compensation. Yeah. Wayne, thank you so much. Stay tuned.